Welcome back to another Addicted Fishing Trout Tutorial. Today, the suns are out, the guns are out, and it's time to go fishing. And if you guys want to learn more about trout fishing, it's coming up next. So guys, today I'm gonna cover my favorite top three methods that I like to use when I head out to catch trout in the summertime. There is many, many different ways to target trout in the summertime, but I think there's three of the most efficient, and that's what we're gonna be talking about. The first one is a spinner. There is a huge variety of trout spinners out there on the market. I'd say it's probably second to bass plastics. When you head into the tackle store, it can kind of be intimidating at times because you see this huge wall of spinners and you don't know which ones to grab. The key is to get a good variety. Before I talk about the actual spinners themselves, I'm gonna talk about the rod setup that you wanna use. Two of my very favorite rods is the Okuma Salilo and the Okuma SST. The Salilo is a little more budget friendly setup and the SST is a little bit higher quality. Both work very, very well for using these spinners, but honestly, I like the SST most. The SST rod I have in my hand today is a six foot six, two to six pound rod. This thing is an absolute riot to catch fish on. You can see just how flimsy this thing is. It has a real limber backbone, and why that is is so that you can cast these small lures very easily. I'm gonna show you how to add a little weight to the spinner and cast just a normal spinner here today, but the nice part about a flimsy rod like this and that two to six pound rating is you can cast very, very easily. What also helps with casting that easy is using a lighter braided line. I like to use braided when I'm trout fishing, one, because there's a lot of sensitivity, two, because you can see where you're fishing in the river. Today, we're gonna to be fishing a lot of moving water and a lot of structure, so it's important that you can actually tell where your line is out there in the water so that you can properly fish. Anything from about an eight to a 15 pound test is gonna work best when you're casting small spinners for trout. The reason is it slides to the guides really easily. And the main reason is because one, you have that high visibility, you have a lot of sensitivity with it, but that light line will cut through the water very well and allow your spinner to sink down towards the fish. So you're probably wondering, how do we not scare the fish with that high-vis line? Obviously, that stuff is very, very bright. The easiest way to do so is to buy tying a blood knot or some sort of uni knot to a fluorocarbon line. Now, if tying a blood knot or some sort of uni knot is gonna be too difficult for you as a beginner fisherman, you can use a barrel swivel to create the separation in between your fluorocarbon and your braided line. Most times during the summertime, you're gonna have clear water, you're gonna have low water, so you wanna go down on your pound test so that you're not spooking the fish. Now, the rigging is as simple as this. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna take my eight pound test, I'm gonna go through one side of that swivel. I'm gonna give myself about a four inch tag in, I'm gonna do just a typical fisherman's knot, where I wrap that line five to six times around my main line, go back through the eye I created, hashtag wet your knots, and pull it tight. The other end of my setup is gonna to be to my main line. And that's gonna be my braided line. So I'm gonna run my braided line through the eye of the hook, seven wraps, again, back through the eye that I created, hashtag wet your knots, and then pull her tight. Now depending on how clear your water is, you're gonna to wanna to go with about a three to a four foot liter on the other end of your swivel. So good way to gauge that length is to go from the middle of your chest out to the end of your arm. With me being about six foot tall, six one maybe, from my middle of my chest out to the end of my arm, it's about three to three and a half feet. If you're a little bit smaller person, I'd go just about a little extra, another six to 10 inches past that, and then you'll have a perfect length. Now onto talking spinners. Now you guys, there are so many different options of spinners that you can use out there. Um, many different brands, many different colors, uh, many different sizes in particular, but one of my favorites is the old fashioned rooster tail. Another one that I really, really love is the Panther Martin. And another thing that works very, very good is either the Castmaster or a little Clio. Now what spinner you use is really going to depend on the kind of water that you're fishing. If I'm going to be fishing really deep and heavy water, what I mean by heavy, by fast moving, lots of big rocks and a lot of boils, I'm going to use something like the Panther Martin or the Castmaster. If I'm fishing fairly shallow water or water that's moving quickly across rocks and it's only about three to five feet deep, I'm going to want to stick with something like the Rooster Tails. All right, I got my Panther Martin tied on with my Fisherman's Knot. I'm going to run it about three to four feet up to my swivel. Let's go fishing. Okay, we've made it to the river, and an absolutely beautiful one it is. And the method we're starting out with today is the same one we just got done talking about, and that is the Panther Martin. The beauty of a Panther Martin is its weight. That's why I really will go to this specific lure, depending on the exact kind of water that I'm fishing. As you can see here behind me, we have this perfect little beautiful trout stream, and you can tell on the far side of the river, it's a lot deeper than it is on this side. The beauty of the Panther Martin, again, is its weight and its sinkability. So I'm gonna usually choose this one to fish deeper and darker spots on the river. When we switch to a rooster tail here in a minute, I'm gonna show you and you'll see the drastic difference in the kind of water that we're gonna be fishing. So for now, we've got the Panther Martin on, let's show you how to fish it. So one thing we always wanna remember when we're trout fishing, and that's for every technique we're gonna talk about here today, is that the fish are normally always staring up river. Uh, the beauty of the trout is that they are a very feed focused fish, so they live to eat. These things aren't migrating usually, they're not normally focused on spawning like a lot of the other species that we fish for sometimes, 
So what we want to notice is that these things are always using their eyes and looking for predators and for food. So knowing that, I want to always start, and it's kind of the opposite of what you would think. I want to always normally start at the bottom of a hole and work my way up. The nice part about the Panther Martin is it's very easy to cast and you could fit it into the tight places. So let's get that started. Okay, so starting at the bottom of the hole, I see a nice bit of structure over there. I got some big tall trees overhanging over the water and I'm gonna cast up and I'm gonna make sure to get that spinner blades. Oh, I just got hit. Oh, I got hit again. Oh, you got hit again. Oh, he's right there. Oh, come on. Oh, I think got hit from the very beginning all the way back to us. Now you can see that fish didn't get spooked by me walking up to the water because I started down and I cast it up. Mainly what I was trying to say before I got too excited was you always want to make sure to have that spinner blade spinning. It doesn't matter how fast you need to reel. The nice part about trout is they're very quick and nimble creatures. So they will move very fast to get to your lure to be able to bite it. So as I'm reeling back, I want to make sure I'm reeling fast enough to be getting that blade to spin fully. Oh, got him. Oh, there he was. Getting some B-roll for you guys. We just hooked one again. We are, are on the right spot. Oh, there is it. That might have been a steelhead. That looked like a big fish. Now that I've kind of completed fishing that top part of the run, that stealthy part of the run where I'm casting up ahead of myself, I'm gonna start casting about five to 10 feet downriver with each cast, starting to create that counterclockwise motion down towards the bottom of the run. The real important thing is in a situation like this where we have the clear water is to not move your feet too much. That kind of goes off to the contrary of what I say a lot of times in most of these tutorials, as far as wanting to cast, take two steps, cast and take two steps. I want to get myself in a stealthy position and work my spinner through that hole using the weight of that spinner as my ability to be able to cast to the area that I want to fish. So now that I've maxed out my distance with my cast, I'm gonna basically walk down the bank about 10 to 15 feet just out of that max casting distance that I was just casting down to about the farthest point I could make it downriver, and I'm gonna start that whole sequence over again. Okay, here we go. Now I'm again starting by casting back up river, keeping my rod tip low, reeling that spinner blade only as fast as I need to to make it spin. Because the beauty of the Panther Martin is that it will fall and fish at the same time. We don't want to wait for that thing to sink to the bottom and then start reeling. We want to start reeling right away and fish that thing down into the strike zone of the fish so that it doesn't surprise them. They're going to see that thing coming. They're going to see that blade. They're going to anticipate it getting close to them. And by the time it does, they're going to be eating. I've made that same sequence about two or three times. Now we're getting down into the big hole. That's why I want this heavy spinner. Let's go try it out. Okay, just down to my max casting distance again. In we go. And in this situation, I am going to give it about a two or a three count before I start reeling. It's a little bit different in this situation. When there's no moving water, it's not as dangerous to let that thing fall towards the bottom. But normally you don't want to wait till you feel the bottom. You want to just guess how deep it is. I know out there it's probably about six feet deep. So if I wait about three to four seconds, it's going to get really close to the bottom. So here we go. But the key to do that is, but the key with what I'm saying here, is to only do it in these slower moving spots. If we do have any swift current going through there, what that's going to do is it's going to automatically make that thing fall down quicker into the rocks and ultimately make you lose more spinners. All right, now that we fished the Panther Martin through the fast water, I'm gonna show you guys how to put on the rooster tail and then add weight to it. Cut this bad boy off. Tie on your favorite color rooster tail, which in the summertime, mine is the white and the gold blade. Same knot, just normal clinch knot. Put your knots, here we go. Now to add weight to this, it's very, very simple. Instead of putting an inline weight or something that's cumbersome, or I'm gonna to have to actually cut my line and put on, I'm just gonna use a split shot. And this is where having that barrel swivel in line really comes in handy. I'm gonna take my barrel swivel, I'm gonna add a piece of split shot, two pieces of split shot, take my pliers and crimp them both down. These don't have to be extremely tight because they're actually not gonna be able to slide because they won't go past that barrel swivel that I have on there. And just like that, 
I got about three eighths of an ounce tied onto my line, and we can fish deep. Let's go do it. All right, everybody, it's time for the rooster tail. And you'll notice this very, very drastic difference in the type of water I'm gonna choose to fish this is mainly, number one, the depth, and two, the speed. This water behind me is perfect rooster tail water. It has about a one to two foot deep depth. It has a nice riffly chop on top. I've added my split shot like I just showed you a second ago. I got my little white rooster tail. Let's go see if we can get a fish. Camouflage. I'll blend in. Okay, so I've stuck to the bushes with my camouflage. Oh, lost my camouflage. Uh, but I've used my camouflage to make it this far up into the run. Now I'm gonna start fishing from the very top and I'm gonna work my way down. The reason I'm doing that a little bit differently is the castability of this thing. Because it's lighter and it's smaller, which is a great presentation, we're gonna to need to start at the top of the hole and slowly work our way down. So we made our way to the top very sneakily and very stealthily. I'm gonna start by a nice medium cast out to the middle of the river. And again, just gonna reel just fast enough to get my blade spinning. That is the most important part of any of the spinner fishing tactics in moving water, is that you don't reel them too quickly. If you have a, a trout that's aggressive enough and crazy enough, they'll come and hit it. Most often than not, you're gonna wanna reel just fast enough to get that blade to spin. You're gonna feel that slight tension, and then you're gonna feel that fish whack. Nice steady reel, got my rod tip at a 45 degree angle. I'm following my spinner the whole way down so I can maximize my sensitivity. And I'm making a nice, steady, same pace reel all the way back to me here. Okay, I'm gonna make a little bit longer down. Each cast that I'm making, I'm going about one third of the way across the river, more. If I started about a third of a river cast, I went to about a half river cast, and then I went to the three quarter cast, which is that far side. So I'm working my way across the river in thirds, and then I'm gonna start working my way down. Uh, now that I've made those three casts, I made my next cast about 10 feet down and about halfway across the river. Next cast, same 10 feet down river, but about three quarters of the way across. Nice steady reel. Come on, baby, this is perfect water. Oh, there he is, I got him. Oh, he's gone. Dang it. Another fish lost. Now you guys can see that's that systematic nature. I finally worked my way down into where the fish actually was in the run. That's why using those one, or those first, second, third casts, uh, and then moving down river 10 feet at a time can be so, so gosh darn effective. Okay, same thing. And now that I've made it down to the bottom end of the run, I have a very steady current. I'm making about the same distance cast three quarters of the way across the river and swinging it through. And then after each cast, I'm taking two steps down. Oh, got him. Oh, I lost him. Dang it, dang it. So many lost fish today. Once again though, I think it's because these things are particularly small. It's early in the summer. A lot of these trout haven't gotten a chance to grow yet. And that may be why we're not being able to hook them up very well. But man, probably five, six, seven fish hooked already. Not a bad stat. Okay, we fished through this run thoroughly. Let's move on down into some pocket water. Okay, nice little flick under the tree. This is the perfect situation for a rooster tail. Why I like them in this particular element uh, is because of the weight of that spinner. If I use a, a Panther Martin here, I would have to reel that thing so quickly out of the strike zone just to keep it off the bottom that it wouldn't be an effective presentation. Beautiful part of the rooster tail is it really has a nice buoyancy in a situation like this with that fast water. So it moves nice and slow through that current. It allows me to stay in front of those fish longer. Let's keep working on down here, one cast at a time. One cast at a time, 10 round fight. It's a 10 round fight. Oh, that might be the cast. That might be it. Oh, I got hit. Oh, man, just another little one again. That's the cast. Oh, another missed one, but that's okay. Because just down below us is the perfect scenario for the next presentation I wanna to talk to you guys about. All right, so now that we went over what I think is probably the simplest and the most effective way to fish, and that's with the spinners, we're gonna talk about our addicted fixed float setup. So what I have here is an addicted trout series fixed float. These are made by Mustad. We've helped design these. We spent a lot of time designing these things just so that they're perfect for you guys. Now for this setup, I'm gonna use a little bit different of a rod. The 6.6 six is not gonna be quite long enough. I want something at least seven and a half to eight feet long for this setup. There's of course Okuma SSTs that are this length, but I really like the Okuma Salilo. This one is a seven and a half foot rod and it's rated from eight to 10 pound test. 
Now for the real size, I'm gonna use the Okuma Kaimar 30 series reel. Why I want that reel is because it's the perfect weight for this setup. It's not gonna make my rod too heavy, the line comes off it nicely, and again, I have that 15 pound Addicted Enforcer Braid. Now for this setup, you are gonna to need to learn how to tie some sort of unifying knot, whether it's a blood knot, a brittle knot, anything that connects a braided line to a fluorocarbon line is what you're gonna need. Whether you guys can Google that or find it here on our page, Addicted Fishing, go down and there's plenty of tutorials on how to tie these knots, but I'm gonna show you guys really quick how to do this. Why I'm doing this is because I need a bumper line on the end of my line for my float to move on. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a 10 pound fluorocarbon line and I'm gonna connect it to my 15 pound braided line with the blood knot. So the way you start this knot is very simple. You take your braided line in your left hand, you lay it over the top of that line on your right hand, which is the fluorocarbon line, and you're gonna grab it right in the X. From here, I'm gonna take my braided line, I'm gonna hold my, my fluorocarbon line with my pinky finger, and I'm gonna wrap my braided line around the fluorocarbon line seven times. Once I've done that, I'm gonna take my fingers, I'm gonna grab all the wraps that I did, and I'm gonna take my, floor, or my braided line, wrap it back and under my fluorocarbon line with my main line coming this way, and then I'm gonna do the same thing with my fluorocarbon line side. From there, I'm gonna stick that right back to the eye that I created from the side that's on my side. Pull them tight, make sure I have both ends tight, one going down, one going up. Hashtag what you're not. There you have it. The way you can tell you did this knot right is when you have the line sticking out opposite sides of the, of the knot. Uh, if they're both sticking out one side, that knot's not right, and you're gonna have to retie it. Ends. Now on this setup, I try to have at least enough bumper line for the deepest part of the river that I'm gonna fish. I know that I'm fishing for trout today and I know I'm not gonna be fishing anything over about 10 feet deep. So I put about 10 feet of that 10 pound test on here and that should be perfect for my depth. Now to show you how to rig up the dick and fix float. So the beauty of using this fixed float is the simplicity of setting it up. All I'm gonna do here, is I'm gonna take my line, make sure I have a nice, sexy, fresh piece of line. I'm gonna run my first rubber over the line just like so. That's gonna to connect to the top of my bobber. From there, I'm gonna grab my bobber, I'm gonna run it through the stem of that float, just like so. There's two little holes in the side of that float and those are what I'm gonna to wanna to use. After I've done so, I slide it up to where my first rubber is, I'm gonna wet the top of my bobber, and I'm gonna push it down tight. Just like that, I'm halfway there. Next step is take my bottom rubber, put my line through it, just like so. Run it up to the bottom stem of the float, wet that float a little bit, bam, we're ready to go. The beauty of this is it slides up and down your line. Simple as that. So, the next step is to add a barrel swivel to my line. Why I do this is so that I can downgrade my pound test from that 10 pound to an eight or smaller when I'm putting out my next setup. So as simple as this, you put it right to the eye. And seven wraps. Get back to the eye again. Hashtag wet your knots. We're ready to go. So now what I'm gonna use is a four pound fluorocarbon line, about three feet of it. Once again, I'm gonna gauge my three feet. Bam. Sorry, mom. I'm gonna tie that to the bottom end of my barrel swivel. The nice part about this is you can create that separation between that heavy line and that light, but also when you get snagged up and snag up the end of your hook, you don't break off your entire setup and you save those valuable bobbers. Oh, we're the valuable bobbers. We'll be here all week. Now, the setup we're actually talking about here is the Addicted Micro Worm Setup. These things are probably one of my very favorite things to use in the summertime because they really do emulate a very natural presentation. These are the little worms that actually hatch out of the trees that you see the big worm nests. There's many things that emulate these things. There's caterpillars, there's actual ground worms that come out into the river, and this is probably one of the trout's main diets in the summertime is these guys right here. Today I'm going to go with the ghost pink color because it's probably my favorite. Now these worms you can find are on our website, addicted.fishing, and pretty much every one of these setups you can find on our website, addicted.fishing. And these worms come in every single one of our worm colors. I bet there's probably eight or nine different SKUs, so check them out. Get the ones that you think the colors are gonna work best on your river, and try them out. So the way you put these things on, I got the 16th or the 32nd ounce jig head here by Mustad. We also have these on our website. I'm gonna hook it right through the front of that worm, all the way down. And there it is. Now, I think it's important to have this thing put on there perfectly. A lot of people aren't perfectionists with this, but what it does is it allows it to swim properly in the current. If you have it bent, if you only have it in half of the worm, or it's not on there properly, the thing will have kind of a twist to it. And when it's down there floating, it'll want to walk to one side of the current. You won't get a natural drift, and you might not catch fish. So from there, I'm gonna add this guy. Typical knot, once again, this is our normal clinch knot.
back to the eye, pull it tight. We're ready to fish. So the thing about fishing a worm setup in this particular situation is you want to fish a lot around cover. The thing is that these little worms, these little grubs and stuff that these fish will be feeding on fall out of foliage and brush like you see here. A lot of those big, like I said, they look like spider nests, but they're actually worm nests that are up in the trees or little baby caterpillars. And that is what these little micro worms really, really look like in my opinion. So situations like this where you have this overhanging brush, you have all this cover in all this area where these things will be falling out and onto the top of those fish so they can feed on them. That's where you're going to find those staging fish trying to eat uh, a certain sort of uh, food species like we have here which is the micro worm so i'm gonna walk up to the top of the run here we have an awesome brush line going down into this nice little hole perfect situation for a micro worm let's do it so when in a situation like this the worst thing you can do is start too deep so one thing that is very nice about this fixed float is that you can really regulate the amount of depth that you have on your setup so in a situation like this i have a very very shallow riffle over here one thing that i want to check for is the most aggressive and uh, kamikaze style fish, if you will. The ones that want to just fly in and absolutely destroy whatever it is you're using. So I'm going to go shallow as I can. I've run my bobber all the way down to a little swivel that I've attached. I've got my worm down here. It's time to cast it. Okay, first cast I'm going to be making is going to be right up along this little brush line here. Right where those worms might be falling in. Keep my rod tip high. I'm going to be managing that line the best I can so that it's not getting pulled too quickly down in front of my bobber. That is probably the, oh, oh that's a fish. Oh, 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 I was just getting bit. I was getting absolutely tore up right there. Ooh, I better get it back in there. So as I was saying before, it's very, very important that you keep your line above your bobber here. And all that does, the only way you have to do that is just a nice, simple, delicate mend. And what I mean by a mend is just lifting your line up, making sure that it's above the bobber itself. Just like you see here, lifting your line up, laying it above, opening that bale and letting that thing naturally float down into that hole where those fish are going. Oh, wow. That was a fish. Just got smashed a rooney. Bobber almost freaking completely drained. Man, there's a lot of fish in this little creek. I think a lot of them are very, very small though. From what I'm seeing from the bites that we're getting so far, we're really getting a lot of those really fast, sporadic type of bites. So that's okay though. With every little one, there might be a big one. I'm gonna go about a bobber's length deeper. That's how I'm gonna start gauging my depth that I'm gonna start adding to my bobber. And we're gonna cast again, a little bit closer this time. Let's see what's in there. I'm gonna go a little bit deeper again. Send her away. Now you guys will see here, the method to going a little bit deeper each time is really what will make you a better angler and will keep you from losing more of that valuable gear uh, or too much of that valuable gear rather. So my strategy usually is again, I'll reiterate this again, start very shallow, work your way about a bobber's length deeper with every two casts and work your way through the hole until you find bottom or a fit. There he is. Oh man, that was a nice bite. Oh man, that thing drained it. Get back in there again. A lot of bites so far, everyone. You can tell these methods definitely are a big, big feeding source for these fish. But we've stuck with a pretty natural presentation here. The worm's very natural, and then the next thing we're gonna switch to on this float setup is also a very, very natural presentation, which I think is key for catching the most trout this time of year in a situation like this, in a system like this, or in any kind of river where you have a lot of naturally breeding trout. Oh, no bobber down that time. Dang it. Little twiddle never hurts. Give that thing a little bit of movement. Man, he didn't want to taste it a second time, I'll tell you that much. Okay, let's throw one more against this wall. And then in the name of science, we're gonna throw the Panta Martin because the key to being a good trout angler is versatility. Using multiple techniques, uh, moving your way through the river, you switching up those techniques uh, when they are adequate to the type of water you're fishing and fishing a river thoroughly. I think that is the most important part of this tutorial you guys should learn is thoroughly fish rivers and don't be afraid to change up your gear. Okay, putting this away. Grab the old faithful PM here to the rib. See if we get one first cast. Wouldn't surprise me. Now in a situation like this, because we have this deeper water, I'm gonna go with a Panther Martin. Normally, if I'm gonna fish any kind of faster water like we have up here ahead of us, I'm gonna go to the rooster tail. So let that be said, both methods are extremely effective, but I do like to go back and forth to both. Oh, just got hit. There's a testy little guy in there. 
Oh, I just had one on again. Oh, there he is. I got him. Oh, he's gone. Dang it. Oh, got him. Oh, dang it. Three strikes in a row. Three in a row. Zero for three. Jeez, Jordan, come on. User error. Operator error. The lures are working. The bobbers are working. The jigs are working. I'm not working. Okay, last cast. Maybe not last cast. I didn't quite get that one to where I wanted to. Zinger over there a little farther. There we go. Oh, that was good. Oh, something just swim away. Swim away. Swam, swim, swam, swami. Swanson. I don't know. You tell me. Okay. Well, those methods both obviously got some action. On to method number three. And this one, I have a lot of confidence in, especially in a situation like this, where we have a little bit smaller fish. Nonetheless, let's get it started. Well, the next setup, I think, is something that's more underfished than anything else, unless you're a fly fisherman. Now, the reason that we're gonna show you this is because it's just as effective using it on an addictive fixed float as it is on a fly rod, but it's much more user-friendly. And that is a box of good flies. Now in the summertime, the fish really, really do key in on those natural species, and that is flies and leeches. Any single river system in any place in the world, you're gonna have these style of bugs living in a river system, and that's mainly what these fish are gonna be feeding on. So what I have in here is I have a couple different colors of leeches. You really don't need that big of a variety because normally there's only a couple styles, and it really depends on what color the water clarity is where you're fishing. I have olive buggers, I have a couple of black leeches, and I have olive leeches. I've added in a couple there that have a little bit of flash, just a little bit different than that natural color. But then what I have are these little guys here. I have something like a chronomid larva, and then I have things like a stonefly. Now this is kind of an when all else fails technique in my opinion. A lot of times if they're not hitting the spinner, if they're not hitting the artificial worm, they're not hitting actual bait, it's probably because they're keyed in on some sort of natural larva or natural feed in the water. And that is gonna be something you can only replicate with a fly. So because of the time of year, and I know there's gonna be stoneflies in the river, these are actually a stonefly larva. A lot of times later in the summer and early in the spring, these things have already hatched out of the water, but there are still some left. But what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna put this stonefly larva on. This thing has two big, tungsten heads on it so this thing's pretty heavy i'm not going to need to add any weight to it i'm going to tie this on let's go fishing here it is and why i say this is so perfect for the bug and bubble you see i have my little fly on here that i showed you guys a moment ago uh is because we have wood we have structure we have living organisms in the river that living organisms from the river like to live on uh, which makes a perfect scenario. There's going to be fish living in these log jams and around this sort of structure that are eating this exact type of stuff here because this is what these things are going to be breeding on, this is what they're going to be living on, and this is where they're going to be hatching from and again being eaten ultimately by uh, the little creatures that swim underneath those logs. So let's give it a shot. So once again, just like the worm, we're going to start as shallow as we possibly can and I'm going to start as high in the hole as we can. So these things could be hatching off of this upper bank up here off of those rocks. So I'm gonna start about mid-river. I don't wanna lose this thing first cast. I'm gonna let that start sliding down into the strike zone underneath this groovy, tasty, scrumptious little tree. Oh yeah, they're looking good. That looks real good. Okay, next cast, I'm gonna go a little bit farther over there. Let it slide right under there. Don't wanna be losing my stuff here. Oh, I, oh, I just got hammered. Oh. How did I lose another one? You guys, what is going wrong with me today? That's gotta be a freaking half a dozen fish or more. Okay, we're in the zone. Oh, yeah, didn't get hit that time, go figure. Now you can see that th that thing was sitting right under that little cusp, right under that little tiny drop off. There's a little vortex under there. And what happens is as bugs like this float down the river, they'll get stuck in that and swirl around for a second. And it's the perfect opportunity for a fish to come in and nab that thing for dinner. Speaking of dinner, it's about that time for me. Oh my gosh, come on. What's wrong with the world? That's a snag. Better keep fishing through there. Oh, that was a neat. Dang it. These things definitely are liking this thing up and along this tree. Definitely liking it. I'm gonna go a little bit farther. I'm going crazy here. I'm gonna go way up and under. Way up and under, up and under the bro. Oh, there he is, I got him, I got him. That's a fish, that's a fish. 
it's a tiny one, just as we expected. But you know what? It proves a point, and that's a fish. I thought my, I, I honestly, this whole time, everybody, I was thinking to myself, the one thing that's gonna catch these little itty bitty guys that I know are the ones biting is a natural presentation like a fly. And as you can see, I wasn't wrong. What I was thinking was right. Beautiful little stream trout with a big old bug in his mouth. That's what we came for, and it's what we got. A little bit of persistence, a lot of freaking casting, and switching up. You guys, like you said, the last thing I used of the day ended up being the most effective and being able to hook them because that was the actual food that these things were committed to. They weren't just hitting the lure and try to kill it. They weren't just hitting it out of curiosity. They were hitting it because it's what they're eating and it's what they want. I really hope this tutorial helped you guys a lot today, uh, learning how to actually go out and dynamically fish a river, how to break it down, and how to actually have fun with uh, putting in a good effort trying to find some trout in the summertime. Along those same lines and saying that exact same thing, I wanna ask you guys what kind of content do you wanna see coming up here? What videos do you wanna have next? What sort of ideas do you have for trout fishing tutorials? Let's see them down there in the comments. I'm so happy you guys were here joining me today. And until next time, you all stay fishy. We'll see you out there. Oh, perfect. Camouflage. I'll blend in.